Yeah. Hi, good evening. It's uh, Get Ahead in English. Uh, we're going to do another poetry masterclass tonight on a poem called The Emigre by Carol Rumans. Um, just by way of introduction, um, my name is James Harper. I'm head of English at West Somerset College. Um, and this is one in a series of sessions on some of the poems in the Poet Power and Conflict cluster that maybe get left to, towards the end to cover, or they are poems that aren't always teachers' favourites. And I'm testing myself really um, by trying to deliver lots of detail on these tricky poems that actually can be very, very fruitful for analysis and indeed could come up in the exams. So, all useful and hopefully um, you get something from them. So tonight we're going to be looking at a poem called The Emigre. Um, this is an apt opportunity for you to pause this video um, and go and grab yourself a copy, preferably one without any notes on it, of this poem or find one online so that you have something to refer to during the session. So off you go, pause it and uh, off you go and uh, we'll resume when you're ready. Okay. So a little bit first about the poet. So Carol Rumans was born in 1944 um, and she is um, still very much an, an active poet today, um, regularly writing and publishing new collections. She's also um, works for The Guardian, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so she was born in South London, studied philosophy at university. She didn't actually finish that un uh, university course. Uh, she dropped out, I think, in year two or three. Um, and pursued her creative writing uh, instead. Her first poetry collection, though, wasn't published until 1973, at the age of 29. Um, she writes lots about female voices. Um, so you will find that if you read um, Rumen's poetry, she writes through the voice of quite often mothers, grandmothers, daughters, sisters, um, and those family relationships are important to her as well. Uh, but actually her biggest inspiration, her, her hero, if you like, is Philip Larkin, um, who was also very interested in family. Um, but uh, that male voice and, and her quite strongly female voice are an interesting partnership, actually. Um, she writes a lot about being an outsider as well and traveling to foreign destinations. Um, we see this particularly clearly in the emigre. She's now professor of creative writing at the University of Hull. All right, just a word on these notes. So context is interesting, maybe um, potentially useful, but you don't need to know any of this stuff to do well in your GCSE. Um, what is a better way of dealing with context, Mark, is to think about the big ideas in the poem. And this poem today has some really big ideas. Um, and hopefully, although they're not necessarily on the slides, but I can talk you through it, there are interesting links to things going on today um, in 2023, in June of 2023, when this is going out, um, you might end up with some clear modern links to this poem. It's not an, a, a silly old poem either. Um, so this isn't a poem that is like some of the ones we've, we've looked at uh, previously from a long time ago. I think it was written in 1993, um, but it's, uh, a poem that really does still resonate very strongly in this decade. Um, and I, said, I mentioned about The Guardian. So she, she has a weekly poetry column um, at The Guardian. She chooses a poem a week, I think. It's really nice. And if you're into poetry at all, it's a bit of a, a, a must read. So a little bit about the poem itself. And we will do a reading, a read through of the text in a second. So the title first, um, I pinched most of this from the Poetry by Heart website, which is really good for certain poems. Um, so an emigre, note there is an a, a acute accent over that second E. So this is a, and a double E indeed, it's a feminine form of the word. So we're talking, if we're, we're thinking about this poem and we're specifically looking at a female voice here as a feminine version of this word. But if you emigrate, it means that you leave a country. And if you're an emigre, really, you're kind of forced to leave a country. There's a reason why um, you're leaving. Normally political reasons. It could be social reasons as well. Um, you might 
uh, marry somebody who is uh, of a different nationality and wants to go and live with them in their home country. Now, you would be an emigre or an emigre with the double E uh, and the accents if you are a woman. Um, and we, we might have a little bit of a look here today at how maybe this poem is a maybe more of a metaphor than we think it is on the surface. So do we actually think that this is really a poem about, for example, a young girl who leaves a, a war-torn country and goes to live somewhere else? Could it be that we could use some of those ideas and translate it to something else in our lives or in people's lives? So hopefully there'll be time towards the end of the session for us to just jog back to this slide and think about this point again. So an emigre, or an, uh, if you emigrate, that's different to being an immigrant who immigrates, uh, because an immigrant is somebody who's left already and is now in situ in a new country. So immigration policy, uh, which is a big thing at the moment, we talk about it all the time, um, there's lots of rhetoric around it. Um, and I think it would be fair to say that the word immigrant is loaded in a way that an emigre is not. Um, so when we're thinking about when we think about immigrants and think about immigration, we're thinking about people having already left, for example, um, the Ukraine, for example, um, and coming to the UK um, to settle down, perhaps temporarily or perhaps more permanently, um, and they would be considered immigrants um, seeking effectively political asylum. So the, the, I hope you understand the difference. So, so some of them emigre uh, is in the process of moving, they are moving, they're forced to leave normally, whereas an immigrant is somebody who's left already and is in situ in a new country. The poem begins here with memories of a country that has been left behind as a child. Uh, and whatever news the speaker receives about the country cannot detract from the impression of sunlight she associates with that place. Um, so if we're thinking about this as a real place, Carol Rumans perhaps, it's certainly not an autobiographical poem as far as I know, but perhaps somebody like, uh, somebody in, in their childhood was forced to flee um, a country, um, and Ukraine might make a really interesting modern example for, it, for this. Um, you, you, you leave, of course, it's your birthplace, it's perhaps the country of origin of your parents, although it doesn't have to be. Um, and being forced to leave that country under duress must be the most awful experience. Um, <clears throat> but if you're young, um, it's unlikely that the, the images perhaps of war um, are the things that you take away with you. The, you're, you're remembering the positives, you're remembering those, those associations as she does in this poem with lights and with um, joy and with pleasure and with dance and with all sorts of things that come into the text. But also, um, it may be that the poem wants us to consider that maybe it's not a country, that perhaps it's a time that we are moving from and to, or a person, or a phase in one's life. And I think it is very rarely um, in the study guides talked about, but we could be looking here at a poem that deals with metaphor. And um, this is a kind of an internal conflict rather than necessarily a war. Although there are military words and there are words associated with war, um, we, we want to be keeping our, our options open here. The second verse or stanza in the poem speaks of time threatening her um, and uses the language of yearning for something that's banned by the state. Um, if something's banned by the state, is, is, it has happened in the past where language, for example, has been banned um, and people are no longer allowed to speak the language um, that they once um, had, it might be a dialect form or it might be um, a regional variation on language, perhaps, um, or a language associated with, with a religion, perhaps. But also, it's slightly more common to think about um, being outlawed or being legislated against when we're talking about things like love or we're th th talking about things like kind of family um, and 
culture and tradition as well. So it might be that we want to play around with some of those ideas during the session. And the final stanza begins with a simple melancholy statement that there is no passport to allow a way back. And yet the narrator writes of being visited by her city, talks of her relationship with the city in terms of love and devotion. The city of walls is introduced at the end of the poem and appears menacing and threatening. Darkness, death and shadows feature in the last four lines, but is the final word sunlight significantly optimistic? So this is a nice little summary of the poem with some analysis, but we're going to do some deep dive analysis um, on the poem as we normally do. So that's from the Poetry by Heart website um, and you can hear a student, I think, on that website reading the poem and uh, that they've learnt off by heart. Sometimes can be really powerful to learn um, some of your te set texts off by heart. It gives you real confidence in the exam. So I'm going to do a reading and I'm not quite sure that I can do it from memory. So I've got the poem to guide me and um, read along with me if you'd like. So this is The Emigre by Carol Rumans, 1993. There once was a country. I left it as a child, but my memory of it is sunlight clear, for it seems I never saw it in that November, which I am told comes to the mildest city. The worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view, the bright, filled paperweight. It may be at war, it may be sick with tyrants, but I am branded by an impression of sunlight. The white streets of that city, the graceful slopes glow even clearer as time rolls its tanks and the frontiers rise between us, close like waves. That child's vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll opens and spills a grammar. Soon I shall have every coloured molecule of it. It may by now be a lie, banned by the states, but I can't get it off my tongue. It tastes of sunlight. I have no passport. There's no way back at all, but my city comes to me in its own white plain. It lies down in front of me, docile as paper. I comb its hair, and love its shining eyes. My city takes me dancing through the city of walls. They accuse me of absence. They circle me. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. My city hides behind me. They mutter death and my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. Okay, I often find it quite useful when teaching these poems to think about how each poem feels, what it evokes for you. In last week's session we looked at My Last Duchess, which is a, you know, whatever way you want to treat it, it's a kind of quite heavy, foreboding, menacing poem, isn't it? It's a poem that really um, is a, a, a quite disturbing insight into a particularly disturbing individual. Um, whereas the poem I did the week before, The Prelude, has a little bit of both. It has the lightness um, and the joy of childhood and innocence, and then it's juxtaposed really heavily uh, in the final third of the poem with this, this menace um, and, and this, this darkness that enshrouds him. This poem, um, isn't that dissimilar from the prelude, is it really? Because certainly the first two stanzas here are very light um, and are very maybe naive, a little bit like the 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 speaker in in the prelude, young Woodley. Um, there are references to the negatives, but she dismisses them. And again, in the second stanza, most of the language here is very positive, as if she's trying to make sure that she retains that sunlight clear image of her home country. But then in the third stanza, by the second half of the poem, of the stanza rather, we have this darkness enshrouding the text. And it can be quite useful comparatively. Students find it difficult sometimes 
to compare the nitty gritty details of each simile. Um, maybe you should do your make, make most of your comparison through standing back and looking at the poems uh, together in that way. So how is the tone changing? I might argue if you choose the prelude in the emigre, which is would be a really interesting comparison, um, that actually the tone mirrors the other poem. It's bright and it's hopeful and it's optimistic and then it's cast over with a shadow. So let's do the poem line by line. All right, feel free if I'm going too quickly to stop and pause um, and mull things over on your own or with a teacher. Let's um, let's work through this poem um, for grade nine, which is really how I'm teaching these sessions um, to give you enough to score your grade nines. So the poem begins in a familiar sort of tone. There once was a country. Uh, we've seen other poems, I think, together that begin in this tone that, that almost feels like a story beginning. Um, so it's uh, it's the beginning of a tale um, or the handing down of a tale. Not dissimilar to Ozymandias, for example, um, poems that begin in the sense giving you uh, an account of something. I met a traveller from an antique land who said there once was a country, I left it as a child. It's not that dissimilar. Also look at the past tense. Um, it signifies loss. There once was a country, like once upon a time, we are in the past. This country no longer exists. Let's be absolutely clear about it. Right from the get-go, Rumens tells us, that this country no longer exists, certainly not in its in the form that she remembers it at. So is it a futile experience, this whole process? Look at the ellipsis there. That's a technical thing that's were easy thing worth picking up on. So it suggests maybe the beginning of a flashback. And we have this sense of retreating now back into her past. I left it as a child. First person is clear now. The poem is very personal and sincere. Um, it feels like she's opening up to us. I don't know how old the narrator is or sort of the voice in the poem um, is supposed to be. That's speculative. Um, <clears throat> but it certainly um, is, it, it feels authentically a child's voice um, at times or certainly a recollection of, of what it was like to be there as a child and to relive those childish experiences. Could you argue that this is a child narrating throughout? But my memory of it is sunlight clear. So the word sunlight is used four times in the poem. And this is the first mention, obviously. It's a what we would call a, a, a motif, a recurring motif is a bit tautologist. It's a motif. It's a word or an idea that recurs throughout a text. So I think if you're going to write about the emigre, you have to write about this word, this idea of sunlight and what it represents. It's positive. It's hopeful. There's something childlike and naive about it, though, as well. So every time we see the word sunlight, this is what she's taken away. This is what she's been branded with. Um, this impression of light. Um, we want to be able to write about that in detail. Is that impression of light something that is um, distorting the truth? Is it something that uh, she clings to perhaps naively, not knowing full well that this is um, not how this country is any longer. OK, so the poem begins on those this, these two lines very much with a sense of the past. For it seems I never saw it in that November, which I am told comes to the mildest city. And the most important thing I think to take away from these two lines is the language of um, Tentativity. Is that a word? Tentativity? Doesn't sound like it. Tentativeness? Um, she is tentative. I can guarantee you that one. Um, she's never experienced these negatives firsthand. When she was there as a child, I mean, maybe as a child, your parents protect you from the worst. 
right? It may well be that, you know, your parents protect you wherever you live um, and you might live a fairly comfortable life um, and they still protect you from those things that go on around you that will upset you or will disturb you or will traumatise you. Um, so it may well be that the country was in some sort of moral um some sort of distress or or turbulence or turmoil at the time presumably it was otherwise it wouldn't have left um but she never saw it in that november so the november here presumably signifies the cold and the dark it's winter most parts of the world it is something here that would signify for me war potentially in the context of the rest of the poem it feels like it, it it probably represents war symbolically. But you don't have to read it that way, I suppose. November here could um, signify some other form of turbulence in the child's life. Um, and therefore, you feel, feel free to bring your own interpretations to it. I, you notice on the left hand side, I've got a little box there that comes from My Last Duchess. So please ignore that. Um, that box will be deleted for future presentations. OK, I feel feel bad. I don't normally make mistakes on these. So that that one over there needs to come off. Anyway, which I am told comes to the mildest city. So there is here a little interesting juxtaposition of adult wisdom. Juxtaposed against childish kind of joy and innocence. So November here perhaps represents experience, so William Blake would say, um, and the mildest city is more the innocence part of it. Does that make sense? Um, and if you look throughout the rest of the text, we get these images that might represent mildness and peace and beauty and grace and heaven and so on. Um, and then we've got other images that are associated mainly with the adult world, that are associated with darkness um, or with the prospect of um, death, for example. OK, so hopefully that makes sense. She says, the worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view, the bright filled paperweight. So she's being told, she's presumably being told why they've had to leave this place or why she's had to leave this person or why she's had to leave this particular time behind. Um, <clears throat> but again, she receives the news. She doesn't see it for herself and she's not there maybe to do that. So the language again is passive. She is acted upon rather than an agent herself. She doesn't see things for herself. Um, and there's a kind of a stubbornness about it then. So so she's not allowing those perhaps quite authoritative people, maybe adults in her life who were important to her, to break her original view. And the word break there might be a useful one to highlight. Um, <clears throat> so you can talk quite clearly about how she resists um, any next sort of negativity. Um, so she's a, it is a form of resistance really isn't it here and you would you know people do have close connections and bonds to the country of their origin uh, perhaps her parents um, are originally from that place the bright filled paperweight that's an interesting metaphor here um, that i wrangled with quite a lot in teaching this poem well what's a paperweight okay so it holds paper down um, it is something that therefore has to be fairly solid and heavy um, in order to do its job. Um, and they're normally made of glass um, and blown glass. So fill and filled with sort of color and and um, texture as well. <clears throat> so so what's her original view of the country is she sees it as a bright filled paperweight, colorful. Um, also, the light shines through that too. Reminds me of another poem, Tissue, which we would will do next week. But it's also solid. It's also something that is substantial. It feels maybe to a child kind of fairly immovable. I mean, paperweights aren't that heavy, but you know what I mean. There's something about it that is substantial. Um, 
so she can't move it. She can't break it. You try breaking a paperweight. I think probably would would have quite a difficult time of doing it. I thought although I think you could do it. Um, links also to, to later ideas about paper. Um, so the paperweight and the paper. Um, the paper is referred to perhaps later on in the poem as the city, whereas the country feel is the paperweight. I wonder if that metaphor extends in that way. And this is the last uh, couplet of the stanza. It may be at war, it may be sick with tyrants, but I am branded by an impression of sunlight. So in that first line there, uh, you'll see that the um, impersonal it is used as the pronoun, and it's something later on that the country becomes more humanized or personified. Um, but at this stage, there is a distance between her and the country, I would suggest. Or maybe it's the city that's personified rather than um, the whole, whole country. But there's anaphora there. So the repetition of it may be, it may be conditional. It, she's unwilling to reassess her view. This is a country that unquestionably, all these adults are telling her um, is at war or is um, in trouble or is corrupt um, and they've had to flee it because it's dangerous, sick with tyrants, um, metaphor slash personification perhaps there. Um, it may be those things, but it doesn't matter. She can't reassess it because she is branded by an impression of sunlight. Interesting. And the word branded here works as a metaphor. So to brand something is to scar or to make permanent um, to imprint upon. So uh, Harry Potter and his, his, uh, his scar is a branding, isn't it? Cows and horses are, uh, are branded. Um, so this idea of being permanently affected by an impression of sunlight. Branded seems like quite a definite word, but impression seems quite vague. What does she really remember? How reliable is this narrator? If we were reading a novel and we had a narrator here who was telling us these things, we would think that they were deeply unreliable. We might like them and we might think that actually they're saying something that's truthful and honest to themselves, but actually they aren't telling us the story of the country politically that we want. And that's perhaps then not what this poem is about. It's a more of a poem about memory and about the fragmentation of memory. So we might have other poems that we compare it with that are also arguably unreliable. And you think of other poems in the collection that have a narrator or tell a story that we might question. Remains comes to mind. My Last Duchess certainly comes to mind. Um, you could argue that the way in which something like kamikaze is told is open to massive speculation as well. So that's a good connection, a good way in. Note the word sunlight at the end. So at the end of each of the three stanzas, there is the word sunlight plus that additional sunlight in line two. And I think I would say in the exam that because she ends each stanza with the word sunlight, she wants us to be left with that sense a branding. Um, and <clears throat> even at the end, when the poem becomes more negative, we'll come to that later. Um, she still wants to leave us with this impression of sunlight. OK, so we're all clear on the first stanza. Let's move on then. Feel free, by the way, to. Um, ask any questions um, if you're online live and if you aren't and you're watching this later on you'll find our contact details at the end. The white streets of that city, the graceful slopes glow even clearer as time rolls its tanks and there's a little bit more but we could leave it at that for the moment. So look at the imagery that's used to describe the city. So we move now from country to city. We zoom in cl more closely to um, things like environment and architecture here. The white streets of that city. That might remind certain people who've lived 
um, overseas, perhaps of maybe southern Italy or the Middle East, um, in which architecture might be um, quite white and bright Turkey as well. Um, but if you don't buy that or you would, would prefer a different interpretation, then go for heaven because we have the graceful slopes as well. These are images then that are bright and that are light and that have no rough edges. Everything is smoothed over. The graceful slopes glow even clearer as time rolls its tanks. Assonance, I haven't put that on the slides, but you can hear those long vowel sounds there. The graceful slopes glow even clearer time rolls its tanks lots of o sounds which slow the pace down interesting form mirroring technique or technique mirroring um the subject matter then because this section of the poem is all about time and if she's deliberately trying to slow the time down through the use of assonance that's got to be a good grade nine point to make hasn't it so, thinking about the dilemma she has, people are trying to tell her that her city, that her country that she came from is sick, that it's poisoned, that it's corrupt, that it's in war and turmoil and she needs to leave, or she has left. She's in the process of leaving and she's an emigre. Um, well, what we end up with here is time. Um, and the separation of, of her from her childhood experience becoming a kind of an enemy. So as time passes, you would expect that her memory fades. She says that it doesn't. In fact, she says it glows even clearer. But we might question that um, because she sees the way in which time rolls its tanks. The militarized language there strongly gives us the sense that she is leaving a country that is now afflicted by war um, and war then is used as a metaphor to represent time it's the enemy and the speaker tries to resist her memories fading but as i've said already they glow even clearer Hopefully that makes sense. There's some good points to make here, isn't there? there? There's lots and lots in this poem that sometimes go goes overlooked. Um, I said a complex metaphor. Um, I think time being militarized in the metaphors in the poem, and it does in the next line as well, gives us a real sense that the narrator does understand that the distance between country and herself and the time distance as much as anything else will cause her problems and this is linked to that previous section and the frontiers arise between us more ideas associated with war and control so a frontier linked to things like borders um, and often you know a frontier might be the edge of one's territory or the start of a new territory that's being claimed um, it's as if these borders, which might signify control, um, are coming at her almost. She feels hemmed in or she feels as though she can no longer return. Um, and then we get this phrase close or close like waves, the frontiers between her and her original country. And she's probably, um, I don't know why I think about moving from um somewhere else to the uk and i shouldn't really be thinking that way more likely is she simply crossed the border from one country to another and it feels to her like those frontiers between the countries the kind of the no man's land or the zones interchangeable interchanging between close on her like waves but the word close and close could be either so does it suggest that simile that the frontiers are close, that they're nearby, like the waves might be nearby on the coast? Or does it mean they close in? That would be the more interesting use of the word. 
overwhelming then. Time attempts to drown her relationship with her homeland. The waves close in. I would, if I was being uh, examined on this poem, or I choose it indeed, and I think it is a good choice for an exam, I would be thinking about both ideas and blow the examiner away with um, the idea that the word close and close are two different words that could be used in, 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 in either way here in this text. <clears throat> so this bit's interesting too. That child's vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll opens and spills a grammar. I feel like this these couple of lines don't really have a grammar. Um, the, the grammar slightly gets lost in the text here. I wonder if that's deliberate by Rumens. She's talking about language and talking about language, the loss of language, um, that actually the control here is starting to slip as well. That child's vocabulary, the language she grew up with, the language she learnt as a child. It's very difficult, isn't it? To um, you don't lose a language like riding a bike. You don't lose that. Um, and if it's something that you know she went to school learning and developing, and her first real friends and so on, that was a shared language. Um, then it's going to have really positive connotations. Language is really important. And language isn't just the words in a dictionary. Language is also things like accent and dialect um, and saying I love you and saying I hate you and all the other things in between. So language and vocabulary here are, is a really interesting concept that you shouldn't ignore. She carries it like a hollow doll. And I imagine the language, when I first read this poem, I imagine the language being inside the hollow doll um and that the hollow doll was precious and fragile and that's still my favored reading here um i think hollow doll um for me represent is like a porcelain doll perhaps it's something that is fragile and precious that maybe if broken um will open something else up or will, will spill something out in this case more vocabulary but say what you like about it it's a simile that works on a few different levels it's also of course linked to childhood again um, precious cherished memories and the hollow doll may be impregnated with the culture and language of her past and she brings it brings that with her um, I was reading a poem today to year nine that talks about language and accent being stored in a box um, so it's not an uncommon metaphor to have vocabulary um, stored somewhere in a specific place. Well, this doll opens and spills a grammar. So compare that to the solidity of the paperweights in the previous stanza. Um, I feel like the doll wants to speak almost. It may be that the doll is the, the thing that, that would be doing the speaking, if you see what I mean. Um, or perhaps it's broken intentionally, perhaps, so she can hear and recall the language of her childhood. It's a metaphor, so you've got to treat it in whatever way you feel that works the best for you. The word spills is definitely important because it suggests it's hard to contain. It brims over, all right? And we have ideas to do with containing emotion in loads of other poems. Poppies, for example, War Photographer, these are poems where people try and um, and bayonet charge, try and restrain their emotions um, rather than allow them to flow. Whereas this poem feels to me much more cathartic. Soon I shall have every coloured molecule of it. So read that line on its own. It sounds greedy. She wants to eat it all up. She wants to take that. Uh, grammar, that vocabulary, that language, and she wants to, to have every part of it. Um, molecule, a scientific word that suggests seriousness, but also suggests that if she consumes it, it becomes part of her. So it has this physical quality to it as well. Um, she feel like moving from one country to another has meant that she's lost some of that physical connection to her homeland. 
fragile, precious, every coloured molecule. I just see gems and beads and coloured stones and things inside that por porcelain doll. Not a dissimilar image to the bright um, paperweight, filled paperweight um, in stanza one. Now this bit's interesting. We talked in the introduction about whether or not the lie banned by the state might refer to things beyond the realm of language now that it might refer to illicit relationships or it might refer to something that is now deemed to be um, against the ruling powers in that country. Um, whatever it is, it is this idea that, that language can be banned, it can be censored, propaganda, the way in which war-torn countries um, censor and restrict um, the news, for example, that's certainly something going on at the moment, isn't it? Um, we have a very narrow view that suits the dominant ideologies of the powerful in the country. But, she says, she can't get it off her tongue. The return to this idea then of the language and the sounds, the accents, the dialect of her homeland is, is permanent. She can't get it off her tongue. It's stained there, similar to branded. Um, that metaphor then suggests that the language that she has is part of her and her identity. Then link that to the coloured molecules as well. Um, she almost imbibes it. It becomes part of her through the, its consumption. And then it tastes of sunlight. So one of my favourite methods in poetry is synesthesia where you mix different senses together. We've got sunlight here, um, something that is visual and something that you know, we see and we can visualise very easily in this poem in its early stages is suffused with sunlight. It's a really bright, glowing um, light poem, isn't it? But then she says that the language that she has tastes of it too. And taste and sight and smell and all those sorts of senses are very closely connected. And some people will have particularly strong connections between light, for example, and and taste. Um, but the mixing of those senses can, is is a little confusing for the average reader. Um, and that's deliberately there, I think, to almost give you a sense that she's not quite clear anymore of what it is she remembers. Um, sunlight at the end of the stanza, as if the poem wants us to be branded by it too, already mentioned that so we can move on. Okay, so the final stanza then takes a slightly darker turn, but it doesn't happen straight away. Although the first line is relatively negative. It's got two negatives in it. Um, if you just read this line on its own, you would think that it's hopeless. I have no passport. Okay, so that's very functional and cold and clinical. The passport, though, is something that she obviously would need to return to her homeland. It's been taken away um, and she's waiting for a new one for, from her new country. But she won't be going back anytime soon. There once was a country, however. Um, it's not as if the country perhaps exists in the same form. There's no way back at all. So even if she did have a, a, a passport, um, perhaps there wouldn't be any access to that country at all in the first place. It just doesn't exist in the same form. But, but contrast, my city, my city, per, a, 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 a possessive pronoun now to suggest that this is a place that truly belongs to her. My city comes to me in its own white plain. I think in the introduction, we talked about um, a lover. Um, this to me sounds like it could be that. There's certainly some idea of relationship here that goes beyond how you would normally talk to talk about a place that means a lot to you. Um, or maybe not lover, but child or family member, the doll. Um, it comes to her, her city, she can't access her city, but her city comes to her. The obvious reading of that is it's a memory. Um, she can't return, but her memories are vivid and striking enough for her to be able to recall it in 
all its detail or in some of its detail. And the detail that we get again is connected to whiteness, brightness, lightness, its own white plane. The word plane could mean a couple of different things here. So on first reading, you might think its own white plane refers to an aeroplane, which would be a reasonable reading. I don't have any problem with that at all. Um, although the word plane doesn't feel particularly poetic, um, it's there are other words in the poem that aren't either. It's an abbreviated form, but fair enough. Um, it could be. Or it could be a flat surface. So the word plane spelt like that, a white plane, a plane um, is a, a word that you might end up associating with simply something that stretches out. Um, and then that links quite nicely with some of the other descriptions of the city in the previous stanza, although those had slopes and now it's flat. Um, a paper plane is another option. So you have a bit of both. So you have like a what the white paper, the docile as paper, remember in the previous stanza. So that would work. It's almost as if the childhood image of the paper plane is possible too. I think with the emigre and one of the reasons that students um, maybe don't like it um, is because there are multiple readings of different phrases. And trust me, I've read all that I can read on the poem. Um, to try and help you with your own interpretations, but come come at it with your own or with your favourite at least and think carefully about how the poem works. Anyway, it's off to see her, right? The city wants to be with her. It lies down in front of me, docile as paper. I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. Ah, oh. so the city comes to her, it lays itself down, it's submissive, it, um, it, it, it's beneath her, perhaps. It's something that wants to, lies down in front of me, feels like a dog or a cat. Um, it is something, again, that almost presents itself to the speaker, personification, if you like. Um, docile, the word docile means placid. Um, you know, it doesn't answer back. It's not not animated though very different in contrast to words like um i don't know frontiers rise close light waves um sick with tyrants sick with war these this word docile always feels an opposite to the words that you might use to describe a war zone paper again I, it's presumably no accident that paper weight is used earlier and now we have paper um or that maybe the word plane might also give us a sense of paper too. There's a gentle quality to the poem. It's fragile um, and would work really nicely with tissue, which also obviously talks about paper and, uh, and light as motifs that occur in this text as well. But the other connection here might be to dolls. So I comb its hair feels maybe maternal or paternal um, and the the speaker combs the um, the hair of the city um, and loves its shining eyes that seems weird if we're comparing it to um, a plane or coming even coming in on a plane um, but it works best when you consider the doll metaphor again um, because you might well do that with a doll. Um, seems that the city is like a childhood companion then. And there's care and there's attention and there's love here. Um, the child wants to preserve what it can and make its city look respectable and, and feel cared for. Another reference to light in the word shining um, and so on. There's this strong bond and strong connection even if it feels slightly childish or naive. Nearly done. My city takes me dancing through the city of walls. They accuse me of absence. They circle me. So the first line still retains that positivity. My city. Three times um, my city is used in this particular stanza alongside the, the city. I think five references to city. Um, but with the my, the possessive pronoun, there's a real sense of ownership 
and a connection here. My city is my city. It's my um, brother or sister or mother or lover or whatever you want to say. There's something about that. My last duchess, not maybe a good um, comparison point there, but there we are. Um, dancing, active at last, the city that lies down, docile as paper um, in front of her um, and, and wants to have its hair combed and wants to have its uh, be stared at in its shining eyes, is now dancing. Maybe it was being prepared to go out and to do this. So there's energy and there's joy here now. The, 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 the child um, is reliving um, or imagining his or her homeland again in joyful terms as it comes to them. But then there's a shift immediately um, on Jean's here of walls, and more negative. So the final parts here of the poem feel much darker and more oppressive. This is about claustrophobia and suffocation. They accuse me of absence, they circle me. There's lots of different ways we could look at they here. Who is it that accuses her, or let's say her, the speaker, of absence? You left, you left, you ran away, you fled, you're a traitor. They circle her. Um, they close in like waves, maybe. They are looking to pressurise her. Who are they? The military? An invading military force? Are they questioning her loyalty? Um, who are they? Could they be friends and family members who they've left behind? Um, who are the they you don't have one answer for? You come up with two or three plausible ones and you hedge your bets in the exam and you say that the language here is deliberately ambiguous, which it is. But the they feels like a them and us, right? A them and us between the opposition between the, the, the city and the child and the other people, this kind of oppressive, dark, vague force in the poem. And this bit, contrasting with the sunlight in the rest of the text, they accuse me of being dark in their free city. Look at the contrast here between the motif of sunlight that we've had in the rest of the poem and then this sudden darkness. They accuse her of being dark. Well, that isn't how we've seen it. There's a lot going on in this line, in these this, this sentence, really. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. It's no longer my city, it's their city. And it's a free city. Well, that feels like propaganda. That feels like a line trotted out by those people who have now invaded or taken over or the tyrants or the new regime. It's not the impression given by the speaker, that's for sure, where everything is light and bright and white and graceful. It's something now that has changed. But her city still remains. So the two here kind of clash and coincide. My city hides behind me. That's a powerful little image, isn't it? Like a like a younger child hold, uh, hiding behind the older sibling. Um, fear and terror here. It's childish again. Sounds like a bullied child, maybe. It The city of her childhood does not like this one little bit. Back to they, they mutter death. There's so much in this poem, there really is. That verb mutter is interesting in contrast to earlier references to things like vocabulary and grammar. It feels like the child would not have heard muttering when she was younger. Um, she has that those coloured molecules of the child's vocabulary with her. And that for her is sunlight clear um, and she's branded by it. Whereas these people now that have taken over her country mutter death. Um, it's vague, it's an unnamed threat and it's powerful, really, really powerful. 
And then this final line has a great deal of impact as well. And it's back to this motif of light. And my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. My shadow falls initially sounds dark and gloomy in, in coinciding with the rest of the, the text too. Um, but in order for a shadow to occur, you need some form of light. So there is still hope. The memory is not entirely tainted. It is something now that she feels like maybe she's coming to terms with what it is that has been going on in her country all this time. So the evidence of sunlight, I've said, is a more positive conclusion, but maybe it's a growing up as well. Um, and the mere idea of her shadow means there is still life and hope and presence. So she's there. Um, but actually there is maybe a realisation that not everything is quite as beautiful and crisp and glowing and light as it was when she was a kid. And that's it. So I think um, I think this is a great poem where. Without too much work and effort, I think every line can give you something. Um, but the best students will zoom out initially and look at the whole and think about how the poem's tone works. I think it's a quiet poem. I think it's a thoughtful poem. I think there's something beautiful and nostalgic about it, but I think also that it does touch on some of those bigger ideas about displacement, maybe about diaspora, meaning to move, move the movement of people um, and the culture that they take with them. Um, and there's lots of different ways that we could play around with these ideas. And one of the other attractive things about this poem, I think, is it does work with lots of the other poems. So don't just count the emigre, um, make it one of your revision poems. I've convinced myself that I should give it more time in class. Um, and I'm going to wrap this up now. So, Olivia, I don't know if there are any questions or comments that have have come through i assume not no no sir no questions okay. no problem so um it's 57 minutes past six so i'm going to say that that's a 57 minute lecture um all done and dusted thank you very much indeed if you do have any questions or feedback for me um, there's an email address there um, and there's the website for past recordings Please watch some of the, the past ones are really, really useful. Um, and yeah, I'll see you next week. We'll be doing um, a poem called Tissue, which is uh, another one that teachers and students sometimes avoid. Going to have a jolly good go at trying to convince everybody that it's well worth revising. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye.